raise the flag. Light the cauldron. We, we declare, declare the, the game's Odyssey, Odyssey open. open. Welcome to the Games Odyssey podcast, your home for stories of glory from the Olympics and Paralympics. I'm Jonathan Jordan. And I'm Sarah Patton. We both love the Olympic and Paralympic Games, and we love history. But most of all, we love Olympic and Paralympic history. From the epic and inspirational moments we all love, to the, well, the more bizarre and controversial moments, we're fascinated by it all. Which is why we are on a journey through all of the Olympic and Paralympic Games, from the ancient Olympics held at Olympia, all the way to now. All right, before we move on completely from Antwerp 1920, we do want to spend a little more time with one of the quote unquote mermaids we mentioned on the last episode. Okay, now these are these are not real mermaids. Ariel is not making a guest appearance here. Okay, Uh, this is a history podcast, not cryptozoology and If you haven't listened to that episode, we talked about how the term mermaids was used as a derogatory name for female swimmers from the U.S. in the media, Um, and specifically for that first group of women swimmers that the U.S. sent over to the Olympic Games in Antwerp. But, like, the total bosses that they were... And we talked about this last time. They really leaned into that name of mermaids and they absolutely dominated the women's events, especially our subject today, who I think we can safely call our newest member of Club Kainiska, Athelda Bleibtree. But who was Athelda? Well, I guess that's what we're here to find out because I personally had never heard of her before. Sarah, I always have to ask, had you heard of Athelda before? Not that I can recall until prepping for the Antwerp episode and of course this one. So I'm in the same boat as you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's one of those many athletes that we've talked about before has kind of been forgotten about in Olympic history. And so that's part of why we want to make sure that we tell her story and keep her memory alive because she did make a really amazing impact on swimming, especially for women's swimming, and just has a really, really cool life story and legacy. So we're going to get into that life story and legacy here in just a moment. But first, let's take a little bit of a break, and then we're going to come back and talk a little bit about Athelda's background. Adelda Blybtree was born on February 27, 1902 in Waterford, New York. She was the second child of John Blybtree, a funeral director, and Marguerite Quant, who worked as a sales clerk at a Bloomington's department store. Her parents separated when she was young, and she and her brother John lived with their mother. When she was young, she got polio. And at the time, this was actually considered a disability because of the long-term side effects that usually persisted even into adulthood. So when Athelda was 16 years old, she actually started swimming to counteract the side effects from the disease. So I have to throw in here, we've heard a similar story to this before with Ray Yuri, who we mentioned back in St. Louis 1904 and London 1908. Uh, so if you don't know about that or you haven't listened to those episodes, you can go back and listen um, if you can tolerate hearing about the rest of the St. Louis games. <laughs> um, but yeah, same thing with him. He had polio and started uh, doing track and field because he was wanting to counteract those side effects of polio and ended up becoming a massive Olympic champion. So it's really cool that we're hearing a very similar story with a getting into swimming and using it therapeutically to overcome the effects of that terrible disease. So very interesting that we see this happening. Now, Athelda, in her case, she loves swimming so much that she ended up joining the Women's Swimming Association, where she was then coached by Louis de Breda Hanley, who was a well-known coach at the time. And with some coaching from him, she quickly went from being a beginner 
to a world-class athlete when in 1919, at the age of 17, she set world records in both the 100-meter backstroke and the 440 freestyle, uh, which Sarah, of course, for anyone listening who loves swimming at the Olympics, uh, the notion of a champion teenage swimmer should not be very surprising, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah, Thelda, when she broke the world record in the 100 meter freestyle, uh, her swimming style was described in the media as erratic. (laughs) And according to a reporter for the New York Times, quote, In her energetic efforts to lower the world's mark, she veered from her course on two occasions, her most conspicuous victim being Miss Helen Moses of Honolulu, who at the 50-yard mark was forced out of the race because of a collision with Miss Blime Tree. (laughs) So talk about rough waters, but I mean, (laughs) (laughs) she really wanted to break that world record, apparently. (laughs) I like it. I like the competitive spirit. Yeah. And and look at the the media here giving her the benefit of a doubt that she wasn't being, you know, I guess, uh, Mm -hmm. vicious in running into a competitor. But just, you know, she was just really trying to do her best and veered off course. Right. So, yeah, (laughs) I don't know that we would see that same graciousness extended today in the media. Oh, absolutely not. Absolutely not. And and that should not happen today. Like, no, that that will not happen. Like, you should be kicked out if you collide. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we have lane markers now. So that that should be thrown out there is they did not have clear lane markers a lot of times in these races. So things like this would happen and it wasn't necessarily a reason for disqualification like you would see today. Uh, but anyway, right. in August of that same year that she broke the world record, she competed in another 100 meter freestyle race against Australian Olympic champ Fanny Dirac, who we talked about back in our 1912 Stockholm episode. Uh, So that should be a familiar name for people. And she broke Dirac's world record by eight seconds, which is wild to think about. That's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. We're talking like Katie, Katie Ledecky style dominance. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> how she like stops and can look back at her competitors. So for a modern yeah. day example, also in 1919, she got a lot of attention at a public pool in Manhattan beach. When she swam without wearing the heavy stockings, women were expected to wear at the time. This was considered nude swimming. So scandalous. <laughs> <laughs> Even Which, though she wasn't course, actually I'm, nude. <laughs> right. Over here, I'm thinking, man, girl power, you go. <laughs> if you didn't hear our full episode on the 1920 Olympics, we mentioned that women were expected slash required to be clothed head to foot. And sometimes these were known to get snagged on underwater obstacles, which resulted in the death of a couple of women in New York. So. Yeah, you do you, girl. Yeah, safety first. (laughs) Yes, come on. (laughs) Anyway, when she did this, she was arrested and cited by the police for the stunt. But still, she made quite a splash. The only reason she didn't get in more trouble over it was because the public sided with her. And so there was public pressure to let her off the hook. Not long after, it became a normal thing to see women at the beach with bare legs as women felt empowered by Athelda's boldness. She also became a bit of a fashion icon when she was one of the first noteworthy American women to cut her hair in the daring new Bob style (laughs) that was catching on as the roaring 20s arrived. I love her. I love her. I love her. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Definitely a trendsetter. Um, Uh So getting into 1920, over the summer, she blew her competition out of the water, literally, winning every race by wide margins and in a variety of different swimming conditions. So again, we talked about her breaking Fanny Dirac's record by eight seconds. So 
think about that. Those are the kind of wide margins we're looking at in all of these races. Uh, so once it was decided that the U.S. would be sending a women's swimming team to Antwerp, there was really no question for the AAU about naming her to the Olympic team. So backtracking for a second, Sarah, to some of the trends she was setting between dress code and hairstyle, what do you think? Did she get the haircut because she just liked it, which is fine? Uh, or, you know, do you think she got it because she thought it would help her be more aqua dynamic, I guess, if, if that's the term? Or, or, or maybe a little bit of both. What do you think? Um, if I had to speculate, I'd say maybe a little bit of both. And I mm -hmm. certainly, if you know me, you know I am not a fashion expert. But we <laughs> do know that a lot of times um, trends come over from Europe to the United States. Mm -hmm. And I would assume that that was happening around this time. So I'm going to say maybe she thought it was trendy. Like she's probably not the first person to get a bob, even if it was still kind of new. So, you know, maybe she took some, maybe she took a cue from European women, but she mm. also could have seen that and thought this might help me in the water. Why not try it? So I'm going to speculate that it was a little bit of both. What do you think? Yeah, I think it was a little bit of both because I imagine this is the age before everyone was wearing swim caps. I feel like when I've looked at mm -hmm. pictures of the I was wondering that from too. this era. Yeah, and so, you know, in the pictures that I've seen, no one is wearing a swim cap, but also they're out of the water when those pictures are being taken. So did they remove them? Or I don't know, maybe someone else out there with more of a history pedigree than we have can fill us in on that. But either way, uh, she was definitely, you know, to use the pun again, making waves in in style mm -hmm. and in swimming. So on mm -hmm. that note, let's take another quick little break and then we're going to come back. And now that she's headed to the Olympic Games, we're going to talk specifically about what she did there. So we'll be back in just a second. All right. So to talk about Athelda's Olympic experience. As a reminder from the last episode, the U.S. team almost did not make it to Antwerp in time, but a last-minute military transport was able to take the team across the Atlantic, including Athelda. In the 100-meter freestyle competition, she set the world record twice, once during the third heat and then again in the final. With all this, she became the first American woman to win a gold medal. We talked about Margaret Abbott winning golf in Paris in 1900, but she had been given a porcelain bowl as a prize and didn't <laughs> even know she was in the Olympics. If you want to hear more about that, go listen to the Paris 1900 episode because that was quite a story. Yeah, it definitely was. So if you, again, if you can tolerate Paris 1900 and all the weirdness of it, definitely give that one a listen. But yeah, there's a, to me, there's a huge difference between a porcelain bowl and a, a gold medal. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong. Bowls are nice and all for eating cereal, but uh, give, give me <laughs> well, the gold medal. And actually medal. <laughs> knowing that you're, actually knowing that you're in the Olympics makes a difference too. <laughs> that does make a difference. Uh, but hey, she had fun playing golf. There's that at least. So, <laughs> but anyway, back to Ethelda. Uh, so the next event up for her after the 100 meter was the 300 meter freestyle where no surprise, she also set a world record because why not? And then finally, she was the anchor leg in the four by 100 meter freestyle relay, where again, the US team ended up winning gold. So because of this, she remains the only athlete, male or female, to sweep all the swimming events in one single Olympic Games. Now, of course, that's because there were only three events. Like, we get that, that now there's about 7,300 swimming events <laughs> in the Olympic Games. But still, that that's pretty braggable that she's the only athlete who, who can say, yep, I swept all the swimming events at the Olympic Games. Pretty cool. Now, it's actually thought by some that she probably would have won a fourth gold medal if the backstroke had been included, 
since she held the world record in the 100 meter backstroke at the time. But that event wasn't added to the swimming program until four years later in Paris, 1924. So it, it's conjecture, but again, people kind of assumed she would have won that one too. After her unprecedented accomplishment, she was personally congratulated by King Albert of Belgium for her achievement. So Sarah, here is my question for you. If a royal was going to personally congratulate you for one of your talents, which talent would you pick? <laughs> Are we talking like real talents or are we in dreamland where we can pretend to be Olympic athletes? No, re real talent. Something that you <laughs> okay. can actually do well. Okay. Well, I think it's listed on our website that I have this little side adventure that I do called cookie decorating. And mm -hmm. I, you know, have my little side biz and all that. And I'm not going to say I'm the most talented cookier on the planet, but... I, you know, I, I know some tricks around here and I've had some cool opportunities with my cookies. And I'm just going to say that I have this dream scenario that the queen, Dolly Parton, is going to try my cookies one day and congratulate me on them being awesome. So, yes, I'm putting Dolly Parton in royalty and I'm going to say cookie decorating. <laughs> Bet you didn't expect that. <laughs> I, I did not expect that. And the weirdest thing is this is the second time this week that Dolly Parton has come up in a conversation with someone. Oh, Dolly comes up in conversations like once a day for me. Yeah, she does not come up in my life very much. So two times within a week <laughs> well, is a big deal. <laughs> I mean, I will say part of what inspired that when I was looking ahead at this episode is um, there is a fellow cookier of mine who actually had the privilege of making cookies for Dolly Parton. So it's not insane to think that that could happen. But the girl that I know who made the cookies, hers are so much better than anything I can make at this moment in time. So I just got to keep getting better. But it mm. could happen. It could happen for us normals. So what about you? What talent? Oh, that that's tough. So I'm, I'm better at asking these questions sometimes than I am answering them. <laughs> I, I, I own that and I fully admit it. Because, uh, yeah, I don't really know for sure what I would want a royal to personally congratulate me on. But I I'm going to go with an old talent. Now, this is something I've not practiced in a long time, so I'm probably not as good as I used to be. But when I was a teenager, I was really, really good at balancing objects on one finger and on my nose. Okay. Yeah, like I could at one point I could hold a broom still on my nose for at least a solid minute. Wow. And, and I'm an incredibly clumsy person. So <laughs> so I don't know why I was good at doing that. Um, but that's something I used to be good at. Again, if you were to ask me to do it today, I don't know that I could. But apparently I had a lot more time as a teenager than what I have now. So I guess if I have to pick a talent, that would have been one that I would have wanted a royal to say, you know, well done, chap, well done. So there you okay, go. Okay, well, my challenge for you is to make a video, <laughs> make a video for us to post online of you balancing things. Yeah, oh, I'm going to have to practice first because, again, it's been a long time since I've done this. But uh, but yeah, I mean, picks or it didn't happen, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll post All a picture right. of my cookies. You post a picture of you balancing things. Come on. All right. I'll get to work on that. And yeah, let's take another quick little break. And then we're going to come back and talk about Athelda's life after the Olympics. Antwerp 1920 would be Athelda's only Olympic Games as she decided to go out on top. But after the Games, she became a star and went on a world tour to help promote women swimming through some exhibitions. This included swimming in New Zealand, Australia, and even a stop in Hawaii where she went surfing with fellow 1920 Olympic champion Duke Kahonamoku. Speaking of surfing, she also surfed with the Prince of Wales, the country whales, not the animals. So that's two royals that she's met now. A couple more and she'll have a great hand in poker. <laughs> During her amateur career, she never lost a race winning every American championship until she decided to go pro in 1922. 
So she went pro in May of 1922, but here's the deal. She found out pretty quick, there just were not a ton of opportunities to actually be a professional swimmer. Whoops. And then when her record started to be broken, people kind of started to forget about her as her 15 minutes of fame was used up. But she did at least find regular work as a swimming instructor. It's also reported she rescued a woman and her two children from drowning in 1925 at Narragansett Bay in Rhode Island. So yeah, hero status. She got married in 1927 to a businessman named Frederick McRobert, and they had one child together, their daughter, Layla. And then the following year, she signed a contract with the Keith Theater to perform a swimming exhibition on stage as part of a vaudeville circuit. But then the tour had to be canceled because the day before it was supposed to start, the canvas tank got a leak. All the water poured out and ruined the carpet. You that that's a shame. You never want to ruin the carpet, apparently, in a theater. Um, <laughs> in fact, the theater blamed Blibe Tree for this, and they demanded she pay a thousand dollars in damages. I don't know about you, but that seems a little unfair to me. I yeah, mean, I don't like that. Yeah, not like she designed the pool. Like you hired her to swim in it, so she's gonna swim in it, right? So anyway, not not her fault as far as I'm concerned. But then the New York Daily News came to the rescue. Well, kind of. Uh, They were in the middle of a campaign at the time for more public pools to be built in the city. And so they offered to pay the $1,000 fine from the theater if she would swim in the Central Park Reservoir as a publicity stunt. So swimming in the reservoir was technically illegal because it had been built as part of the city's drinking water supply in, you know, sometime in the past. So there was a public health rule thing about, hey, don't go swimming in the reservoir. I mean, Sarah, you used to work for a city government, so I'm sure you used to have to deal with those kind of things, too. I mean, yeah, we definitely had our ordinances, but still. Like, this whole thing was a mess. Yeah, it it was a thing. But so with Elda not having the $1,000 that she needed to pay, she agreed. And on June 11th, 1928, she went for a swim in the Central Park Reservoir. (laughs) Um, Also part of this stunt, so she wasn't alone. uh, There was also Amelia Gade uh, Corson, who was the second woman to ever swim the English Channel. And there were also three other male swimmers. So the five of them uh, jumped into the reservoir and then they were duly arrested and they had to spend one night in jail because of the incident. Now, their lawyer made the argument that the reservoir was no longer used as a drinking water supply and that the five swimmers, quote, were anxious that the thousands of swimmers in New York should have a pool which they could reach without hours of subway travel and inconvenience. So, you know, we think about it getting hot here in the South, which it definitely does. But if you've ever been to New York in the summer, it definitely gets hot there. I used to Mm -hmm. scoff at Northerners talking about it being so hot in the summer until I actually visited New York in the summer and experienced it for myself. Yeah, it's totally a thing. It is. It is. Yeah. So I don't uh, I don't mock Northerners (laughs) anymore (laughs) for complaining about the summer because I've experienced it now and understand And yeah, at this time, there just weren't a ton of public pools in New York City. So that was really what they were campaigning for is, hey, let's let's have some more public pools so that people can actually cool off, enjoy swimming, all that good stuff. And guess what? It ended up working because the publicity from her arrest did help convince New York Mayor Jimmy Walker to take action and build more public pools so which that's an incredible legacy yeah like absolutely like that's just that's incredible i i love that as someone who like you said did work in the parks and rec department for a local government Mm -hmm. um i really appreciate that action was taken yeah and even though yes she needed the money to pay the theater back honestly i think she would have done this anyway (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah. I mean, she had been arrested before for, you know, swimming, quote unquote, nude. And this was all about getting more people interested in swimming. So, yeah, I think even in different circumstances, she would have been like, yeah, I'm game. Let's do this. Right. So anyway, so that happened. And that's part of her legacy there in New York. Now, at some point in the early 1930s, she and Frederick got a divorce. Uh, she ended up supporting herself and her daughter, Layla, through swimming instruction, including providing physiotherapy to children who had cerebral palsy and also polio patients, which is really amazing. Again, recalling how she got into swimming herself as a child who went through polio. So really cool to see how that came full circle in her life. Mm -hmm. And then in 1959, she started working as a nurse, focusing on care for the elderly and disabled. So yeah, she kind of blended together her two passions as she advocated the use of swimming as a form of physical therapy, which is still a very common practice today, but I, I, it was a new concept back then as far as what I can tell and it was also around the same time that she got married to her second husband Al Schlafke who worked as a sports writer and frankly that's really all I know about him from the research <laughs> that I did so right, well, there you go. hopefully Al was a good guy she was inducted into the International Swimming Hall of Fame in 1967. So finally, we have someone being added to a Hall of Fame while they're actually still alive, which is a really nice change. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> like, no need to wait until they're gone. Let's honor them now. Seriously. In 1968, she moved to West Palm Beach, Florida, where she continued to teach therapeutic swimming with the elderly. At some point, she ended up being diagnosed with cancer, not sure what kind, and she died on May 6, 1978 in West Palm Beach, Florida at the age of 76. Yeah, and again, that's kind of really all we know about the end of her life. Don't exactly know, again, the full extent of what kind of cancer or what was done, but I'm I'm glad that she was still able to do a lot with her life, even mm -hmm. though, unfortunately, it, you know, that's what brought it to an end. And I think, you know, right. a lot of, you know, a lot of us who have had loved ones lost to cancer can, you know, empathize and sympathize with with that loss. So, right. but as sad of a note as this is, let's, let's take a quick little break and then we're going to end on a, a bit of a happier note by talking a little bit more about the legacy that she left behind. So yes, let's end this episode highlighting Ethelda's legacy and some of the great things that came out of her life. So Obviously, her athletic accomplishments as the first female Olympian to win three gold medals, that's obviously a, a huge deal. But she's also remembered for being a very vocal advocate for women in sports in general, and specifically advancing the sport of swimming, not just for women, but for everybody, as we saw in that story with her jumping into the Central Park <laughs> Reservoir. Right. So that right there in of its own as an athlete is an incredible legacy by itself. In her own words during an interview with the New York Times, swimming is the best sport in the world for women. When a girl indulges in basketball, tennis, or golf, she is all tired out at the close of the game. But after a girl has had a good swim, she feels relaxed, cool, her muscles are in order and her whole makeup, both physical and mental, is at rest and at peace with the world. Interesting quote there. I wonder if <laughs> every female swimmer would agree with her, but you know, I'm glad she had loved it so much. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I think, I think Katie Ledecky would like a word with you. I mean, because it's exhausting. But anyway, I'm, I'm not going to knock her for this quote because yeah, it, it, yeah. Hey, she was a great advocate. We, need, we, we always needed more girls in sports. 
Yeah, well, and I think it expresses just her general love for the sport and how she mm-hmm. felt about it. And obviously, we hear about a, a runner's high. She clearly got a swimmer's high out of engaging yeah. in the sport. So good for her for just showing that love, even if it does seem mm-hmm. a little bit like overkill here, maybe, <laughs> right. for a modern and audience. I mean, yeah, well, and in a sport like basketball, you know, like I could see it that what she said is true because maybe you're not colliding with other players. Well, I mean, she collided with another swimmer, but you know, what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> at least it's not like as normal, but anyway, she's also remembered for her promoting therapeutic swimming specifically with the elderly and disabled individuals. In fact, her obituary read Miss Blybtree kept her crusade going and spent most of her life teaching swimming to handicapped youngsters in New York and trying to get more pools constructed within the city. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. That's that's a great obituary to have. Yeah, it really is. It's a it's a huge deal. And kind of like we said at the top of the episode, it's not considered this now, but polio was considered a disability back then because mm-hmm. of some of the physical effects from it that took a long time. So Here's kind of the final question I wanted to get your thoughts on for this episode is how do you think Ethelda would feel about the Paralympic movement? Oh, I think she'd love it. I think she would yeah. be completely supportive of it. You know, I, I do wonder thinking about polio as a disability and, you know, thankfully mm-hmm. that's not something that, you know, I, I'm not ignorant to the fact that there's children around the world who still suffer from polio. You know, I'm not going to pretend that that's not still a thing, but that being said, um, fortunately for many people, polio seems to be a thing of the past. Um, But knowing that polio was considered a disability and she was able to show up and be competitive in the Olympics, I wonder if she would also advocate for athletes with disabilities being included more in the Olympic games. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. That's just, I kind of wonder how she would feel about that, which, and I know it's been done um, since right. the inception of the Paralympic Games, but it's rare. So I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm curious what her thoughts would be on that. But, oh, she would be av- all for it because she was such an advocate for getting people in the water, getting people involved in sports, especially women. And so I think the more, I think she would see it as the more the merrier. And this is an awesome movement to get behind. She'd probably be one of those big spokespeople. What do you think? Yeah, no, I I 100% agree. I think she was already on the forefront of seeing swimming being a a great sport for, again, just improving health and Mm -hmm. being good for people. Again, I mean, here she is working with different levels of disability from, you know, children to the elderly. And I mean, everything in between, it sounds like. So, yeah, I think I think you're absolutely right. If if the Paralympic movement had been, um, you know, had been bigger during her lifetime, I mean, I, I could have totally seen her as as a coach for, um, you know, for someone like a Jessica Long or like an mm-hmm. Anastasia Pagonis or, you know, any of these yep. other incredibly talented Paralympic swimmers that we see now. Um, so, yeah, I think she would have been a thousand percent <laughs> supportive of the movement. Yeah. But yeah, to kind of close things out here, I, again, I don't know about you, but uh, I think we're both glad that I found out about Ethelda while doing this research since I'd never heard her story before and that we got to spend a little bit of time telling her story today. Obviously, it's impossible to know every little detail about someone's life, but I am grateful for what we do know about her. Also, for anyone who is interested in sharing her story with others, uh, a children's book about Ethelda was literally just released on August 15th, 20. 22. So it's brand new and it was written by Emmy Award winning journalist Alyssa Boxer. And I will put a link to that book in the show notes. So if you want to go buy it for yourself or your little one or someone else's little one, whoever, uh, you can do that. Now, if you're just discovering the show, you can go back and listen to some of our other athlete profiles like Charlotte Cooper, Elena de Portales, or our episode on Match Sires, who was a pioneer in women's figure skating. 
Uh, those are all people that we've talked about in the past who also made major impacts in their sports. But if you enjoyed this episode, and we really hope you did, then we hope you'll come back next time when we discuss the very first winter Olympic Games hosted in Chamonix, France. But until then, I'll see you later. The Games Odyssey podcast is a production of Wardrobe Media, LLC. This episode was written, hosted, produced, and edited by Jonathan Jordan and co-hosted by Sarah Patton. Show notes, including research sources and transcripts, can be found on our website, gamesodyssey.com. Olympic is a trademark of the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee, USOPC. Any use of Olympic in the Games Odyssey podcast is strictly for informational, commentary, and educational purposes. The Games Odyssey podcast is not an official podcast of the USOPC and is not sponsored, endorsed, or officially affiliated with the USOPC or the International Olympic Committee or International Paralympic Committee. The content of Games Odyssey podcast does not reflect the opinions, standards, views, or policies of the USOPC, and the USOPC in no way warrants that content features in the Games Odyssey podcast is accurate.